education system for the 2012-2013 school year. Uh, Dr. Bo uh, Dr. Lugo. <laughs> We'll just go with it. I'm not known for my spelling, even when it's initials. Um, good evening, um, <laughs> Sir President and uh, members of the Governing Board, as well as Cabinet. Thank you so much for allowing me to come this evening and present to you the recommendations from our uh, teacher principal evaluation uh, advisory committee. And first, I, w I really want to thank um, the Governing Board for putting this advisory committee together and allowing us to explore this collaboratively. I think it, it really has made um, a positive impact and it has produced a better product because we've had so, so many people input. So tonight we're going to present to you some general recommendations. Um, we're also going to review our external peer evaluators recommendation and talk about how we're going to mitigate for some of those areas of concern. Okay. So um, just to, to remind you, and I know you've seen these slides before, uh, the, the vast number of people and the different positions that these people held uh, on for it. And this has been over a two year process that we've gone through this. The dedication and commitment um, and tenacity of all the members uh, who have been involved is, is just amazing. Not only do they work hard eight hours a day, uh, eight plus, and then they come to uh, my meeting and they give 100%. So I, I cannot say enough about how proud I am of, of this team. So as you recall, you've seen this slide before, the statement of purpose was set by the governing board um, to create a fair and equitable model that really focuses on uh, accelerating student learning and uh, student achievement, but also um, aligns with the state framework and the state model. So just to review, the committee um, came up with some goal statements of their own and at the very top of making sure that we enhance and improve um, student learning. It used the achievement process to d drive our professional development. So this is really uh, key. What you'll see here is we focus a lot on data make decision making and aligning that with professional development and um, looking at the growth of our students and, and the growth in, in our system. Okay, so some of the guiding principles that we used as we were going through the process was making sure that we used multiple measures and in, in a value-added way of looking at growth. Um, communicating clearly defined expectations and everything that we have to, to present to you is based on research that the team has looked at and gathered. Um, and then really looking at how do we provide support, again, that, that um, professional development piece for our struggling teachers and our new teachers and, and looking at um, the differentiated support. So again, just to see the tasks that we've gone through, and even though you see, I think, six or seven uh, bullet points, under each bullet point there's several different action plans that go with that. So gathering input from the teachers and the principals that was an ongoing process throughout the years. We had four times where we went formally out to the staff and you know, shared with them the law, got, got their ideas, and then um, moved forward and also looped out. Mm -hmm. But informally, uh, committee <coughs> members would bring different hot topics back to their teams and then come back to the group um, a month later with, with ideas. And so you can see we, we're down at the bottom now where we have the external peer evaluation and now we need to adjust the tools uh, based on their feedback. So here's just an overview of the recommendations. The first thing that we would like to recommend is that we allow ourselves a year to pilot um, the new evaluation tools in a do no harm fashion. So running the two systems simultaneously will allow everybody to um, kind of feel what it, what it feels like to have uh, this process and it'll allow us, we, we plan on meeting 
um, not as an advisory committee, but as, as a pilot group to look at any kind of refinements that need to be made and make those refinements and present them as needed. Um, we're also replacing our labels of um, unsatisfactory, we're, we're recommending replacing the labels um, of unsatisfactory, developing, um, and then we had meets and exceeds in one category, and really looking at replacing those labels with a four-point rubric, which I'll go in more, more in depth. We're looking at having, we currently have a professional improvement plan, um, or it's called a PIP, and sometimes that has a negative connotation. We're looking at keeping the PIP in place, but also developing more of an informal professional development plan. I apologize for adding another um, initial group, the PDP now. Uh, and that's really for people at any level looking at improving and getting to that next level. Uh, it doesn't need to just be those areas of great concern. Uh, Percentage-wise, we are aligning um, our process or observation tool and our leadership tool based on the ISLIC standards at the 55%, uh, percent. looking at collaboration being at 10%, and the assessment data, whether it's the individual classroom assessment or the site data, depending on who you are in the system, at the 35%. We're also recommending that there is a standing um, committee to have an annual review of our evaluation system to look at the impact on mm -hmm. individuals and the impact on the system as a whole, much more important, and then update and refine as needed, especially for the, our pilot year. So a little more in depth, this is the um, it, the recommendations for the teacher evaluation tool, so 50% on the process tool, those are the classroom observations. Uh, the committee felt strongly that they still wanted to leave a level one and a level two for our process tools. Level one being having two formal observations and multiple informals. Level two for those um, teachers who felt confident and who didn't feel like they wanted the stress of having to plan a formal level being multiple informal observations over the, the full year. So they could apply for that. They would not be forced onto level two if they like to have that time to plan. But the level two would be a recommendation of, you know, come in whenever you'd like and um, evaluate me and give me feedback and use the comp the all of the information to mark that. The guidelines and the um, rubrics um, showing a little more clearly where the T4S and the uh, strategies help uh, push the implementation of the standards, the indicators that the teachers are, are using. The T4S um, strategies really um, align closely with many areas and they, they, they will help teachers reach that, but our indicators are much more broad than the T4S. So, and then we talked about replacing the labels with a four-point rubric and adding the professional development plan, and then you'll see the multiple um, product tools with the individual classroom data uh, and the 10% uh, being on the school or grade level data, and then the different assessments that we have. Dr. Lugo, before yeah. we move yeah. on. Okay, slow down. Um, I'll defer to my colleagues uh -huh. first. Uh, with, with the level two unannounced, mm -hmm. or even level one, you have formal observation, I believe you said two, mm -hmm. and then some unannounced. Do you have a minimum amount of unannounced on level one and level two? Is there a minimum that has to be done? On level two, the unannounced, we have it at four. Two per semester is kind of the, the thinking behind that. On level one, there is not a um, set un unannounced. Um, they have the the two formals, one in the beginning and one in the end, uh, one in first semester, one in second semester, and that's really, right now, continuing teachers only need one evaluation, but we're looking at gearing up for the following year with the new laws, which requires all teachers to have two evaluations. Two formal, so, mm -hmm. evaluation. two formal. Two, two form, two formal written evaluations. So theoretically, you could have the two formal observations and no unannounced? 
I guess I'm getting confused. Theor <clears throat> Theoretically, you could have that, but that should never happen. And it really doesn't happen in the Creighton School District. We, our principals are very committed to being in the classrooms multiple times, um, both for informal observations and for coaching and, and supporting the teachers in the classroom. I, I don't know of any principal that I had to say, you know, where, where's your informal documentation for these evals? Under the assessments, different teachers will have different assessments depending on the grade level and the subject level. Mm -hmm. I think we meant, we talked about this in a previous meeting. But how how is their fairness or equity? I'm not sure what word you used in the uh -huh. beginning of the presentation. How do we ensure that when there will be different assessments used depending on other factors that will affect the teacher? Yeah, we, we try to, and we'll go more in depth with that, and I'm going to defer to Dr. Spiller when we get there, but we, we really try to use a growth model with our assessments and the same, similar assessments, the same assessments being used for the different grade levels that are being evaluated, but we'll go with more in depth. These are just the, the general ones. Thank you, Dr. Lugo. Sure. And, and, yep. and you too? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I think the last time we had a presentation on SES was in 2009. <coughs> I was really interested in this. Is this this is uh, based on what we already have? This isn't really new, other than adding like the other formal observation that's required by law. Is that correct? Okay. What's similar, very similar to what we have, and and I did a double bubble map, but I took that slide out. Um, what's very similar to what we have are formal observations, informal observations. What's changing is not the content so much of the rubric, not the indicators. Those are remaining the same. Um, what's changing is breaking out the rubric and spreading it across. Because right now we have um, unsatisfactory, developing, yeah. and then meets and exceeds are chunked together. So what we need to work on now, and it's based on Dr. Lazaro Lasko Kerr's uh, recommendations, is kind of spreading that out so we have <coughs> people knowing when they meet and people knowing when they exceed. And that's gonna, we're not there yet on completely defining that because um, that takes a lot of very um, specific kind of language, and so we're, we're working on revising that four-point rubric. So that's different. The other thing that's different is, how do we say, formalizing an informal professional development plan. Um, I, I know that sounds weird, but really making sure that everybody in the system has a professional development plan. Um, if they feel like they need it, and that it's not a doesn't have a negative connotation because I have a professional development plan on how I'm going to, you know, implement certain strategies. The performance improvement plan, because it's often tied to a notice of inadequate classroom performance, really puts people in an Olympic um, yeah. system. So you'll probably get to this, and if it's premature, it's fine. But uh, with replacing the labels with the points, and the second point, if this is aligned with the state, was what the state was calling developing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess I'd expect that teachers that are in that category would also have a, a, a PDP. A PDP, a PDP, but not, PDP. not necessarily a PIP. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and many of our new teachers come in in developing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that would be, I think, the board should expect that. Yeah. And, and I'd like to make sure that we're supporting them so that, yeah, okay, yeah. thank okay. you. You're welcome. Okay, so just, um, you, you have seen this slide before, but I just wanted to reiterate, we do have, what's different as well is we have to break out our group A teachers and our group B teachers. Our group A teachers are those in the system who have valid and reliable data um, for which we can use uh, to measure the student growth and the student progress. So you'll see that's our, all our mainstream um, English language development classrooms and mainstream classrooms in grades two through six. Okay, so those two bullets should go together. And then uh, our middle school math teachers and our middle school language arts teachers and our middle school reading teachers, they all have data that we feel confident that we can use. So this is what their pie chart looks like. I apologize for the dark gray. It's, it's 
prettier on my thing. The dark gray is the individual classroom level data. The orange, um, which had a line to it, is the 10% on the grade level data. And then the 55% is based on the teaching observational data. Will you go back one slide, please? Yep. Thank you. Okay, our group B teachers, and they are not, um, and so we're not looking at group A being a graduated group B. Group A we see as awesome teachers, group B are our brilliant teachers. And so we really need to make sure, because sometimes uh, that connotation, we're, we're educators, nobody wants a B. We're, we're all A. So our group B teachers, you can see those are, uh, the teachers where we're currently, the state and um, the district, we're currently working on trying to get valid, reliable assessment data uh, tied to them. So in middle, middle school, our math and science teachers, our kindergarten and first grade teachers, we're, we're concerned that they're not, mul they're not multiple tests available. We have some, some measures, but, and so their student achievement plan will incorporate some of those, but we don't have enough that we feel comfortable with making high stakes decisions. Um, in the areas of art, music, band, PE, technology, all our special ed, uh, self-contained, our reading interventionists, and our teachers on assignment, they, they will all um, be considered our group B, B uh, teachers and they will be coming up with student assessment plans, uh, and student achievement plans. So again, that gray area that you can't see in front of you is 35% and that's a student achievement plan. Uh, Dr. Spiller and the curriculum team and groups of teachers have been working very hard right now on trying to um, get parts of these plans up and, and ready and so that they, the teachers can work together in groups and write these plans and have them approved by the curriculum department and their principal in conjunction. Then the site and department um, level data would be the 10% and then for collaboration and then the teaching observation again at the 55%. Dr. Lugo, is the student achievement plan, are there any similarities between that and say teachers who do career ladder? Who do? Thank you for pointing that out and I'm asking just, that question. I'm just repeating to something I think you said earlier, but I'd like for you to expand on. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> the um, student achievement plan uh, that that they're currently working on is uh, based off our model of our career ladder plan. And uh, I know I, I heard uh, Michelle Berg speak the other day about how the student achievement plan for career ladder got the high, very high accommodations because it's very rigorous and it puts lots of pieces into place. The one hesitation that we have with this, um, and we know we're, we're, we're gonna have to work very, very hard because there's a lot of work in creating the plan, implementing and monitoring the plan, and then evaluating the plan. So, uh, but it's not something so new for many of our career ladder teachers, and they'll be able to help mentor uh, the other teachers in the system. So it sounds like it is additional work for any teachers who are group B teachers who are not already career ladder teachers um, having to come up with this plan. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you have teachers who are career ladder teachers, I guess is there, my question is, is there overlap if it's similar, I mean, does some of what they do with career ladder count toward this or is I would, it? Yeah, I would really hope there would be overlap and, and very tight similarities because our teachers are working really hard and for them to do a, a plan for this and a plan for that, um, I think the more we can align and have a laser-like focus, the more successful our teachers will be and the more successful our students will be. So I hope that they count for each other. And given the fact that we have, like every district in the state, a lot of constraints on our resources um, and that we are constantly pushed to have money directed, usually rightfully so, into the classroom, um, and but that has put certainly a squeeze on our administration, who is around and, and what kind of additional staffing are we going to need to help teachers develop these and to evaluate these? At, at this time we have not budgeted um, additional staff to help. We have had conversations about um, expanding our qualified evaluators training 
to have content specialists to assist, and you'll, you'll see that in the plan as well. Um, so I, I foresee people from the curriculum department uh, getting together and guiding uh, the teachers in the development of the plan, uh, helping with some of the observations uh, in a coaching type fashion, and, and helping give input. A lot will fall on, on these uh, student achievement plans, uh, will, will fall on their, their home evaluator though as well, which is their principal. Dr. Lugo, with the student achievement plan, um, this covers special ed also, special education. Yes. So would it be double work for like a special ed teacher to do the IEP, which has to be done yearly, and a student achievement plan? Or would they be aligned to each other? Well. That's a good question. The IEPs are, you know, mandated in our, our um, special education teachers do those on an individual basis for each child. So that is already a, a lot of work on, on our teachers. Uh, I would envision that they would look at their IEPs and incorporate um, some benchmark growth and maybe have their student achievement plan be an umbrella for that classroom to move that classroom forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so on our principal evaluation uh, rubric, here we're we're looking at 55%. You can kind of see where the alignment is with the process rubric, and that's and that's where my typo is. There, there's no A on in ISLIC, so even with initials, I can't spell. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'm stuck. Okay, and then the the other piece of the process rubric would be what the principals are currently working under with the sustainability rubric. We look as as we um, move into this, we're also looking at slowly the next step behind that would be working at, on assistant principals and directors. Now the product tools would be the 35% on the school level data and then the 10% looking at for the collaboration on the aggregate data. Which, so school level data, are we looking at AIMS, reading, and math? We're looking at multiple assessments, and Dr. Spiller will review some of those. Those are the assessments that are currently tied to the principal's merit pay. And so, in some ways, the principal's evaluation tool, what we currently have, is further ahead when it comes to what the law is going to mandate for the year okay. to come. Okay, now um, before I turn this over, I, I need to give great thanks uh, to Dr. Spiller and her work um, with the assessment piece of this because this, this product wouldn't be where it's at if it wasn't for her hard work. Thank you, Susan. And I do want to say that if Susan hadn't set up a wonderful process where teachers were felt free and in a risk-free environment to actually state what they thought their needs would be to build this process, we wouldn't be as far along as we are today. So thank you, Susan. She was a great facilitator. Um, I heard a couple of your questions that I was almost going to jump up and answer while Susan was presenting, but I hope I answer them. I'll keep them in mind and see if I can answer them during my part of the presentation. Um, one of the things I do want to say is, this is my talking point for this part of the presentation, we are trying to build a system that's fair and equitable without bias to every teacher who's going to be evaluated with the system. That is my overarching guideline, it's my parameter, it's what is in my mind at all times. So I'm so thrilled that we have 2012-13 as a do no harm pilot because I hope we can find every bug that could possibly be in the system. And, um, and with our external facilitator, we actually did find some recommendations and we're working on them at now. But if we find that there's another set of bias that comes out during the 12-13 school year, we will address them and, and fix them right away. Nothing, nothing will be, no detail is too small for us to fix. So um, 
When uh, Dr. Lasko Kerr um, reviewed our process, I, I was just so thrilled that we we're going to have somebody else audit all of the formulas and all of the logic that we were using. It was just very important to me. And I know, I know, Miss Susan, she felt a lot, or well, all of the leadership, we felt a lot more confidence if somebody could look at it. So um, her, the expectation was that she should replicate the statistical analysis and determine the validity of our conclusions and make recommendations to us to make it valid and reliable and fair to all of our teachers. So um, she was able to do everything. She was able to say your logic was correct, your formulas are correct, and what was really sort of serendipity it was uh, I, I worked on one file, I gave her another file, and when we couldn't make those files match, it gave us insight on where our system could break down if our files weren't correct. So it's actually really, uh, I was, I don't know, uh, Susan and I didn't share with you, but at the first meeting, one of the first words on the page was she was not able to replicate anything or there was some kind of very inflammatory little comment she had on the on the report and I nearly fainted you know I was like oh my god this is terrible but then when I realized what she was saying um, I said wow this was insightful for us because it just shows you how the devil's in the details and we have to we have to nail them down so um, in addition to providing descriptive statistics for this indicator, um, she's just saying here that uh, she did ensure that um, the formulas were correct um, and that they do accurately total a score which is able to discriminate between the teachers to identify highly effective, effective developing, and ineffective teachers. So um, that's the whole point is that we're trying, we are, we are required to sort them into groups, and we must sort them into group with the validity, reliability, and without bias. So um, I just want to review um, what our progress has been to the state on the recommendations that she made to us. So the first recommendation was about Group B teachers. She had a very small sample size, and what she saw was of those teachers they were identified as developing or ineffective more often than teachers in the group A group. Well, that indicates there could be bias. And so she made some very specific recommendations. One, of course, is there should be a larger sample size. And believe me, during the 2012-13 group year, <laughs> we're going to have an enormous sample size. Second, we need to validate um, the results with maybe what I think she's making saying is, other um, data and um, so we've thought through the process and as Susan told you we've already um, worked with a, a lot of the group B teachers on what is your curriculum uh, what is the specific unit you're going to be evaluated on next year and what is the assessment we're going to use so we've actually uh, worked through all the special areas um, we've uh, done a SAP plan for kinder and first grade teachers. Um, Dana Morrison will be working with our special ed and self-contained teachers to develop a SAP plan. And then we've refined the teacher on assignment as, uh, SAP plan. We've assigned people. It's actually Arnie and Michelle. I guess it won't be Michelle next year now. <laughs> but um, I apologize. So it could be um, Arnie might be working on uh, working with the science and social studies teachers in order to develop um, specific assessments that they're going to be evaluated on. So um, these were our actions, uh, our SAT plans to include universal screener data and other valid and reliable assessments to determine student progress on reaching benchmarks at the end of the year. And in middle school, we're in progress for these plans also. So the action. Um, towards uh, the recommendation for Group B. All of these are in, in progress, and we feel uh, that we will be ready to um, implement these at the beginning of the school year. And they will have already been reviewed th through focus groups. They've already been through three revisions, and we might have one more before we implement at the beginning of the year. Um, so any questions about um, this uh, recommendation number one? So recommendation number two um, is that B 
because we had two different uh, files, she and I, she, and what we could see was the change in cut score, the change in, that when she evaluated the cut scores on her file and my file, they were different because they were two separate files. Her file, um, the teachers were not aligned up specifically for middle school and reading and math. And in my file, I had lined it up, which meant that um, there were about 23 less teachers in the file. All the students were in there, but they were realigned to different sets of teachers. So um, the recommendation is that we need to develop um, the new cut scores after we get the final file. So what we have been doing is we're keeping the methodology, um, we're reviewing our cut scores, um, and uh, we're moving everything into SharePoint. So in SharePoint, we'll have the 2010-11, we'll have the 10 yeah, we'll have the 10-11 data that the teachers will be able to verify. We're going to keep that year as our baseline year, and, um, and then we'll put the 11-12 data that's going to be available during this summer. So our principals and teachers will have two years of data to evaluate, and um, that kind of lunch, uh, that look at over two years will give people confidence that the formulas are working over two years and sort of move forward in the future. So um, uh, SharePoint, uh, we're already looking at the initial um, views on SharePoint, and I feel confident that we should have that up and running uh, shortly within the first couple of weeks of school. Any question about recommendation number two? Okay, recommendation number three. District staff should verify that teachers who do not have points awarded in these higher yield assessment areas are not system, systematically disadvantaged in their final teacher evaluation. So this is where um, our focus was on reading, uh, for, as you know, for the last five years. Um, and teachers of reading seem to have better scores associated with them. So the teachers that are sort of losing out on this are specifically math teachers, our seventh and eighth grade math teachers, because you know, they're busy teaching math, they don't have reading scores associated with them. So we're looking at that, um, and uh, what, we, uh, what we will do when we finally, finally get this final file is we'll look, and it could be that we have to put in a multipli multiplier for the math teachers in order to equate the fact that they don't have um, assessments that are equal to the reading assessments at this time. So um, we are going to be looking at that as soon as we have the final file. Um, this was um, where she was pointing out the, um, the average of I3 RUS EVPT actually stands for uh, Reading Universal Screener. It was 2.6. You can see that's much higher than the other values, which are 2.0, 1.95. So we could see that it was the Reading Universal Screeners and the Acela Growth. Um, these teachers have an advantage over others if they don't have those point totals for them. We actually figured that if the ELD teachers got an extra point from the Azala growth, that probably would be a good thing, because I'm very concerned that um, we don't have bias for our ELD teachers. Any questions about this um, recommendation? Um, so this just reestablish, we will reestablish those cut scores. We've separated out kinder first and second grade, and they'll be grouped First, kinder and first grade teachers, um, they will be in the group B teacher group because they only have one assessment uh, score for us to work with and we want to use multiple assessments. From the um, cut scores for the universal screeners, I've reestablished cut scores for every grade level so that we don't have bias of the younger students who always show, show, demonstrate more growth than the older students. We'll check on math teachers because uh, that's where the bias will occur, and we're, we're going to always check on the ELD teachers. If I can't fix the bias by doing either a multiplier or additional points, then we'll just move them into the Group B teacher category. So we've already started establishing new cut scores, and I just cut, uh, cut and paste them into, into this uh, document just for you to see. Um, I, what I'm doing is uh, sending, what I, this is what I call a lookup table, to the programmer for the SharePoint server. He uses these cut scores to, to let the um, 
to let the, the software actually calculate all of these points for us. And we're really looking forward to when he has this 10-11 data recalculated to check the numbers. Um, I know I'll feel really comfortable when we're up, able to replicate um, this uh, work from where I'm doing it on my desktop with, with Excel, and he'll be able to replicate it into SharePoint. So then we know we have sustainability. It doesn't depend on one person in the district knowing how to run the Excel sheets. So recommendation number four. Um, is about SES. Did you want to talk about that? Sure. So one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that SES is the standard evaluation system, the total package. This right now where we're moving towards is going to be the observational or the process tool. So currently our process tool, um, what Dr. Lasko Kerr is saying, is it really doesn't discriminate between teachers. If you look, there's 42 points total possible on the SES, and 158 teachers are getting 41 to 42 points. Now there could be a, a couple of reasons for that. One of them um, being that there's, that meets and exceeds category is chunked together. Uh, that's part of it. Part of it, it could be um, the enormous amount of professional development that's been put into place, you know, that many of our teachers are moving over. Another thing is we need to make sure that we review for rigor. Are we as rigorous on our SES as we need to be? Um, and then um, professional development training for inter-rater reliability. Right now there there seems to be a lot of inter-rater reliability because I've, the many people are being scored the same, but as we break out the meets and exceeds, it's going to be really important that our qualified evaluators training is ongoing and that we really know what a meets looks like, what an exceeds looks like, what a developing looks like. So here's the plan um, to move towards um, this recommendation. Uh, qualified evaluators training, we have um, already set a time aside before the school year starts to work with our principals and our curriculum group for that. And then we have set aside some time with uh, Dr. Boyle um, on leadership meetings to look at uh, different scenarios, video clips, and get some iterator reliability there. We're looking at increasing the rigor by going to a four-point rubric so teachers know when they exceed and when they meet. And then adding that professional development plan that we talked about earlier, as well as the professional improvement plan. So everyone in the system has an opportunity to really have a plan of action for developing. Now on the teacher training, it's very similar. The initial training, which is a brief overview, will occur during orientation week. We found that orientation week is not the time to go in depth because teachers are trying to get the classrooms ready. Uh, those of you who have been in the classrooms know that that's, that's where their focus is. But we need to make sure that they, they have an initial understanding during that time, and we're planning on doing some sort of um, broadcast where the message is the same, and then principals can stop and answer questions and, and work on it that way. And then having an in-depth training um, with the staff uh, on their site once uh, once they have like a Wednesday staff development time and then reviewing ongoing throughout their professional development uh, on those Wednesdays uh, about you know different indicators on the SES. We, we currently have lots of job embedded uh, coaching and evaluation and informal and informal observations. So um, continuing with that cycle uh, we think will will really help speak to what Dr. Lasko Kerr was looking for. So this last recommendation is we um, right now we have the cut scores for dividing teachers into highly effective, effective, developing, and ineffective. We've actually looked at the teachers that are in the developing and ineffective based on a 10-11 pilot. We've gone out and talked to um, different principals about do their teachers recommend these, uh, resemble these categories. 
Um, and we've already seen where we needed to re make refinements. So when we finally have that final file, I'm um, coming out of SharePoint this time, we will recalculate these changes because what we want to do is take the 2010-11 data to be our baseline data and we're going to keep those cut scores for the next three years. So the teachers know that um, if the target isn't going to move, all they need to do is, is, is hit the target based on the cut scores and um, they will, they, um, the result, increased performance results will, will, will result in an increase in the category that they're assigned to. So, um, like I said, we're going to move it onto SharePoint. We're going to move it from my desktop data warehouse into the SharePoint environment and it'll be calculated. So uh, right now we're working with uh, Jamie Austin, who is an IT uh, uh, staff member who's doing, uh, his work is just phenomenal. So um, if you get to see him, he's a very modest person and uh, I just am really uh, so privileged to work with him. He has wonderful skills. So it's been really a, quite a lot of fun. It is also recommended that the district create a formal process to review this teacher evaluation model, including the use of the SES measure as well as the data utilized. We definitely want to put in an annual review. We want to look at how it performs and we want to make adjustments if it's not performing correctly. We're just so thrilled we get to do a pilot year. This a, it's called Do No Harm. So they'll be using the old system and the new system. and. Uh, and we can really evaluate whether this is going to work for our district or not. Um, so we've added, I think we'll be adding it to the calendar so we can always see where, what the date is for that. We always want to choose that date for when we can pull the data and actually have it analyzed before the meeting. And so um, people were using data to make recommendations um, for the evaluation. So we're, um, at this time, Susan and I are sort of panting towards the end of the year. I'm assigned to the summer workshops and I'm working with the teachers right now uh, to build the curriculum assessments and calendars for next year and all our curriculum based documents, uh, which is why I'm a little bit casual today because, you know, we're working over in the multi-purpose room. I know Susan's been really busy, but this is a very exciting pro uh, project that we're working on and we're really looking forward to implementation this fall. So, any questions? Okay, Mike. Um, my actually, I, I'd like to call uh, Mr. James Hughes um, mm -hmm. and ask him a few questions, if you don't mind, James. Sure. This is the draft draft that we need to change to. Please note draft. So at this point, we've, we've, def we've heard from uh, Dr. Lasko Kerr, Dr. Spiller, and Dr. Lugo, um, but I, I definitely wanted to also hear from the Teachers Association. I know that we've had a few conversations about this at the beginning, and just wanted to hear, uh, to keep a pulse um, from the teacher's perspective, and I know we didn't ask you to prepare, so if you can maybe just per share your personal perspective on how this has uh, been and how you feel about where we're at and we're and moving forward on the process of the teacher principal evaluation yeah so, um i the mostly what i've been told by teachers from the very beginning up until now is just um i would say if there's any kind of uncomfortableness it's probably just a fear of the unknown they don't really know what to expect from it um, they, I mean, they, they understand that they're going to be held accountable for student achievement. There is some nervousness about that, um, but I think they're on the on the other side of it. There are teachers that feel that um, that 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 student achievement, that data itself, can validate some of the things that they're doing in the classroom as well. So there there definitely are both sides. Um, I would agree with uh, Lynn that. From the very beginning, Dr. Lugo has been very collaborative in the way that she set up the environment. She's listened to some very difficult questions and some very um, difficult conversations that we've had throughout. Mm -hmm. And at no point did, did I ever personally feel like it was an uncomfortable place to be. Uh, maybe for her it sometimes. <laughs> uh, for, for, yeah. for the teacher's perspective, um, unless you're new to the system, 
I don't believe that anyone should be surprised at what's coming, and um, I, I think that this year coming up uh, will give them a little bit of an opportunity to get their feet wet and um, be able to see what's coming down the pipe for it as well, too. So, I don't know, does that answer your question? Or? It does. No, I, I think that's very helpful. Uh, I mean, I ask because what I hear uh, often is uh, teachers are totally scared and they don't want this. And I don't hear this in our district, um, but that's part of the reason why the governing board established the advisory committee and we wanted teachers to have ownership. We don't want to just sell it to you later and say, here's, we hope you get some buy-in on this. We wanted you to have the ownership. And so I, I think this is just an informal check on on that coming you know, asking you, like, do you feel ownership in the, in the process here? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you and tell you that I, I think for, for us as an association, this is not uh, the number one issue. It's a, it's a major issue, but it's not the number one issue that we uh, that we feel should be addressed. So. Okay. Thank you. I just want to compliment everyone on the work that's been done. Uh, this was something that um, was not a, um, a something that we chose without being kind of pushed to, to do. This is a direction that the, the overall system is going, and I'm glad that we um, did not did not go about this capriciously. We uh, obviously have worked through all of the models, we've analyzed this statistically to see how everyone is affected by every single one of these models, and I think you're always going to have someone who is uh, going to complain that something's not fair, but I, it, uh, this seems to me as objective, I think, as we can get, um, or, or certainly we're in the process of, of working toward that direction, so um, I want to thank everyone for, for moving that direction. Um, Dr. Boyle, I'd like to ask, uh, um, Phyllis earlier was telling us how we're getting to a point where it's going to be even harder to move the student achievement at the same pace, um, which uh, I think we all understand. Um, so I just wanted to ask, do you think that this system would be helpful in, in increasing student achievement? Yes, I do. I believe that as we move forward, one of the things we're really going to have to address uh, at this point is rigor. And I believe that uh, this system uh, will fairly evaluate. Okay. Thank you. Um, we, the motion uh, or the recommended action before us is to approve a pilot, to pilot this. Um, and also, I, I like to think of Creighton as leading the way in the state, so I wanted to ask if you felt confident sharing our model with others. And I ask because all the other districts are considering what are they going to do. Not all the districts have put in the work and effort that we have. And if you go to the ADE website, there are only two models. There are 238 or so. There's, there's over 200 school districts. Um, over 500 charter schools, and the only models that are public are the Lake Havasu model, which I'm not sure meets the framework, um, and Yavapai County Teacher Performance Evaluation System. So I wanted to ask if you would feel comfortable sharing ours as a model, and if not, I respect that. I just wanted to put that out there and, and ask you. Yeah, I would certainly um, support that, and I believe that the question that I would pose would be to uh, to Lynn and to Susan as we move forward in this uh, uh, pilot year. Um, uh, uh, you'll notice on the front of that book it says draft really, really large. Because <laughs> uh, Susan and I really want to take a fine tooth comb to that document before it's published. Yeah. And so we definitely, um, we, uh, you know, we'll always defer to the superintendent on those things. We always want the district to be always seen in a good light, but we definitely don't want to send a document out that we're not positive that every I is dotted and every T is crossed. So okay. at this time, even when you read through it, I know you'll be able to find some typos in it because okay. um, it's on version 20. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's on version 20, and we still are finding things that we need to correct. So. 
Thank um, you for the suggestion. Yeah, but when it's when it's not draft anymore, I'd love to um, revisit the question. Then. Thank, Thank you. you. I move the governing board approve the pilot instrument for principal teacher evaluation for the 2012-13 school year. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes. Next item is approval to renew the superintendent's contract.